<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources Speaker Series. We're so lucky to have today with us Dr. Alex Wilson. And she'll be speaking on, on One House, Many Nations, Hacking Colonial Systems of Dominance. She is Swampy Cree from a Pasquia Cree Nation and is a professor with the Department of Educational Foundations as well as the Academic Director of the Aboriginal Education Research Centre at the University of Saskatchewan. She completed her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from California State University, Sacramento in 1994, her Master's in Education in Human Development and Psychology from Harvard University in 1995, and her Doctorate in Education from Harvard University in 2007. So we are having a talk here for the next hour with questions and answer, and I hope you will all participate. And then afterwards, we will be having desserts and hors d'oeuvres in the next room, the quiet room, to have a more intimate discussion. There are seats at the front if you'd like to come up. We really like people closer to the front so they can hear properly. Can everyone hear? So, okay. So um, I will start passing these out, and welcome to uh, Dr. Alex Wilson. That's it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to um, speak over here at the University of Manitoba. I actually started the university here in 1982 and stayed here for about three years and uh, didn't graduate, but... Um, had some great experiences here in the university and some not so great experiences, but um, hopefully the racism dynamic has changed a bit on campus in the past 30 or so years. Um, so I'm really happy to be here to present on One House, Many Nations and uh, the work that we've been doing as part of the grassroots social movement, Idle No More. And how many of you have been to an Idle No More event a lot of you, that's great. So um, so that's how, how this project kind of started, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through that, um, the genesis of it in the presentation. So thank you for the introduction, Shirley, and as she said, I'm from the Apasquiat Cree Nation, which is connected to Winnipeg in a roundabout way. So if you head down the Red River uh, into Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipeg connects to Cedar Lake. Cedar Lake connects to the Saskatchewan River system. And um, Opasquiac is on the Saskatchewan River. So I wanted to kind of um, explain that so that you can see how we are all connected, either through waterways or through different relationships. And probably, are any, is there anyone in here from OCN? Opasquiac? Northern Manitoba? So quite a few from northern Manitoba. So we, if we probably talked for a little while, we'd find some way that um, we are related, right? And uh, Or find some ways that we have connections through relationship. And that's part of a principle of Indigenous knowledge. Almost every Indigenous nation and language has some kind of a saying that refers to this notion of the importance of relationality, not just the importance, but the centrality of relationality within our own cosmology systems. And relationality, as was mentioned in this morning's presentation, is not just interpersonal relationships, um, it's also our relationship to everything that's animate or and even inanimate, plants, the environment, sky, water, and then even extends beyond that to our relationships to concepts and theories. So there's an understanding within Cree cosmology that relationality extends to the wider cosmos and that connects to even our thought patterns. And so the way that we talk and um, what we talk about is even subject to this understanding of the importance of relationality. So with every one of those relationships that we have, which are literally millions, um, there's an accountability that comes with that. So that's the term relational accountability. So One House Many Nations uh, is kind of thinking about and acting upon the notion of our relationships, relationality, and taking responsibility or accountability for them.
This is the Saskatchewan River Delta. And for those of us that are from um, all the way, it runs all the way from the Rocky Mountains on the west all the way to Cedar Lake on the east. That's the Saskatchewan River Delta system. It's one of the largest freshwater deltas on the planet and it rivals the Amazon River Basin in terms of size and importance as well because the Saskatchewan River Delta is considered like the lungs of the planet or one of the lungs of the planet. It also serves as kidneys, liver as well because not only are we filtering and creating air through the boreal forest, but we're also filtering water and um, microorganisms and all that in a healthy, delicately balanced ecosystem. Uh, below the Saskatchewan River Delta, underground, there's a parallel river system. And so a lot of our stories that are part of our legends and cosmology um, link to or talk about or teach about the creatures that can move between. And it's not just metaphoric, it's actually, it's reality, right? Similar to the Amazon River Basin, there's a parallel river system under South America that is part of our story system. Um, if you look at that, this uh, photograph that was used without permission, <laughs> I must say, um, has the photographer's name on the bottom there. So thank you to the fellow that um, put it on the net <laughs> uh, for public use. If you think about this riverway, there's a number of things that are monitoring or controlling that, this water system. And I'll talk about those later. But if you look at this, this um, photo, you think about this system that's been fairly the same for the past 10,000 years, so since the last ice age. Um, it's shifted a bit every year with rainfall, with um, you know ice movement, with all kinds of different factors that change the geography. In general though, our families have been sustained by this waterway for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. So this is a real question. If you were to kind of map this waterway, what would your map look like? What would some of the significant features be that you would put on the map? So this is a question for all of you. What would you put on your map and how would your map look? Or how would your map sound? Okay. So she said underneath all of it is rock, so she would indicate in some way, drawing maybe, uh, the connection to rock. Yeah. That okay. there is a connection. That there is a connection to rock. So okay. Others? Yep. Where people live? Okay. So given that, what, how, what would you, so you said you want to name the flora and fauna or maybe where certain plants are found yeah. or certain medicines are found, sacred sites, where there's a rock, a huge rock you might want to avoid if you're paddling, mm. uh, food, where's a good fishing spot, mm. where's a bad fishing spot, mm. where there's rapids. So there's all kinds of things you may map. And your map may look different than the family that only travels the river in the winter, right? Because what will this map look like in the winter? Look very different, your map. How would you record it? Some people may record it in song. Other people may record it in drawings. Others may record it um, 
through stories or other pneumatic devices. So there's a multiplicity of ways that you can um, map this territory if you wanted. <clears throat> These are trees from that forest, the boreal forest. This is right outside of the paw. This was actually last February. Uh, it, those trees are all gone now. And um, I wanted to connect to that because um, the mapping part is really important. Uh, there is about 0.8 of a kilometer of trees in this pile. So we had to use a drone to actually measure it, figure out how many trees were in this pile of wood. Um, this forest, in the, bo the boreal forest in along the Saskatchewan River Delta, is being deforested at a rate greater than the Amazon forest is being deforested. So there's knowledge that comes with the land. And so in, in just that early, um, just what I talked about earlier in terms of mapping, how would your family or community map, that's their connection to their land-based knowledge. That's all held in the language and stories and many, many other ways. So what happens when you start to remove or change the landscape in an unnatural way is that you sever the knowledge system that's intimately connected to land. And there's a term for that. It's called epistemicide. So epistemicide is this intentional severing of land-based knowledge. So genocide is usually thought of when, you know, <coughs> bodies are killed or children are taken or family structures are are um, disrupted intentionally through policy or unintentionally through assimilation. Um, so many of our First Nations lands. Um, this old growth boreal, it's the first cut. <clears throat> this wood was all chipped up, um, made into pulp, and that pulp was used to make special craft paper, and that special craft paper it, because it's old growth, it's got thick fibers, it's very strong, so it's used for cement bags and for pet food bags. So there's an irony in this, in that we're living in one of the richest forests in the world, and we have a huge crisis in terms of housing. So why do we have a houselessness problem in our homelands where we have all these trees? This pile alone could solve the housing crisis, could have solved the housing crisis in northern Manitoba, this one pile of wood. But yet we're shipping the, the paper to Guatemala and to other um, countries, America, uh, to, to make paper. So it's the problem is colonial economics, and colonial economics aren't working for First Nations people, and they're not working for a lot of um, settlers either. So think about all of these ancient trees and cutting those down and then they're either planting new trees through you know different tree planting um, companies or trying to grow new tree, new trees through, um, through seedlings. So the question remains, um, who's going to teach the next generation? So epistemicide is not just uh, in terms of our knowledge as humans, but also the severing of knowledge, land-based knowledge, to the next generation of life. Who's going to teach the next generation of trees when all the old ones are gone, when all the elders are wiped out? Um, so this is a really significant issue. So we're losing our connection to land. We're losing the, the land is losing its connection to, to life and sustainability. This is clear cutting by a Pasquayak. If you drive up there, you probably wouldn't know this was happening because mm. they intentionally leave buffers of forest. So if you're driving along the highways, you have no clue that the rest is clear cut unless you actually go into the bush or unless you fly over. Um, there are a number of factors that have impacted the Saskatchewan River Delta. Um, in negative ways, and one is obviously resource extraction. Um, the second is pollutants. So you think about all the major cities that are on the Saskatchewan River Delta, that's Edmonton, Red Deer, Calgary, 
Saskatoon, Prince Albert, and they all feed into the North and the South Saskatchewan, which meet just by Prince Albert, and then that drains into one river. Um, for many years, all the pollutants went directly into the water. So even the effluents from hospitals, without filtration, went right into the river. Um, recently, there's environmental regulation, but still, everything that drains into the city drains goes right into the river. You probably all heard about the Husky oil spill uh, a couple of years ago. That went right into the river. So unlike when you take a drop of food coloring and put it in water where it kind of dissipates the color, when you're talking about contaminants and pollutants, there's a cumulative effect. So the further downstream you are, the more you get an accumulation of contaminants. And the people downstream tend to be um, smaller communities that are mostly First Nations or Métis people. So we're bearing the brunt of environmental racism the further downstream you go. The other thing that's impacting all of the waterways are dams. So we have the hydro, Manitoba Hydro Dam in Grand Rapids. We have the E.B. Campbell Dam in Nipawin. We have the Gardner Dam. So those are the major dams that have impacted people's lives along that system for many years. And of course, we know that um, fertilizers, phosphates and fertilizers drain into the waterways as well. Uh, lake Winnipeg, 10th largest lake in the world, you probably all know this, living here, number one endangered in terms of freshwater lakes. And that is mostly from phosphates. And there's one other thing too, an American corporation that controls a vast majority of the waterways in um, eastern northern Manitoba, and um, sorry, western northern Manitoba, and eastern Saskatchewan. One corporation. Any guesses as to what it might be? Is that the uranium company? Uranium? Nope. Good guess though. Yep. Nestle? Nestle? Nope. Good guess though. <coughs> Ducks Unlimited. <laughs> Ducks Unlimited controls thousands of waterways in Manitoba. And as early as the 1930s and 40s, mass um, buying out land from farmers and transferring land to Ducks Unlimited, the American corporation whose objective is to protect water, wetlands for waterfowl for American hunters. But there's another agenda, of course. And I don't know if any of you, I'm looking around and maybe a few of us remember 19, in the 1980s, when the province of Manitoba held a referendum around the Garrison Diversion Project. So some of you are nodding. So Garrison Diversion would have connected the waterways in Manitoba <laughs> to the Garrison Diversion in North Dakota, right by Standing Rock. You remember that? Manitobans said no. Um, but that doesn't mean that those waterways still aren't connected. So the only thing that has to be built is the last bit of channel. So there's an agenda, a corporate agenda that has impacted our lives in northern Manitoba that many people don't know about. And Ducks Unlimited in South America has been very controversial in terms of um, crimes against Indigenous people and uh, reinforcing resource extraction and the extraction and commodification of fresh water. So this isn't meant to, like, if you have a friend or relative that works for Ducks Unlimited, like, you don't have to go and be angry at them during your Easter Sunday or whatever. Um, this is critically analyzing systems of power that continually impact the lives of certain groups in asymmetric ways. And it's Indigenous people um, that feel the, bear the brunt of the intersections of all these different forms of oppression that are supported by um, often foreign corporate uh, agendas, as in the case of Ducks Unlimited. So thinking back to that map that we created, or the multiplicity of maps that you would create, and um, here's, here's a few maps that actually exist today. <clears throat> this on the upper left is the range road, whoops, this mouse is a little bit tricky here. 
<clears throat> so upper left is the range road system. So what it's done is it's done a grid. It's also known as a grid. And so that you can do the coordinates of every little piece of land. And um, this, this is in Saskatchewan and, and part of Manitoba. On the bottom is the Canadian well oil grid. It's elegant, logical, and easy to understand. <laughs> Uh, what it does is it documents where all the oil wells are or well, where all the potential oil wells could be. So now you see a different form of mapping that has been used to um, kind of map out but also regulate lands, people, and resources. The top right is the real estate grid map. So for every little square, they've attached a financial value so that the entire country of Canada is mapped out in this way so that you can speculate, you know, wherever your home is, you can see what the square, what the estimated value of it is. And this coincides with, often with oil wells, with mines, with other resources that are in the area. So now you see a different purpose, rather than sustenance, spirituality, navigation, connection to families, relationality and relational accountability, we see a shift in ideology to monetary value. <clears throat> so that's part of the story of um, why we are focusing on, on this topic today, One House, Many Nations. Two-spirit people and Aboriginal women bear the brunt of the intersections of systemic racism, sexism, and trans and homophobia in Canada and have high rates of homelessness. And uh, the current government isn't going to do anything about it, so we are. And so that was a statement from Sean Johnson, who's part of the I Don't Know More communications team. And um, that was kind of the um, theme, is that we're noticing that housing is just part of the bigger, the bigger picture, right? But we decided we would look at that um, housing as one system, and if we could hack that system, then maybe there would be impacts on others. So housing has historically been used as an instrument of social control. So if you think of that grid, um, the grids and the way that the grids have been used, and even the term grid is, is interesting. If any of you remember the early 80s, um, before AIDS was called AIDS, it was called grid. So it was a gay-related immune deficiency. So there's always been kind of like a, a stigma attached to this term grid, and it's always been linked to homophobia, <laughs> to um, colonial, the bigger colonial picture of colonialism. And um, um, different forms of oppression and in the intersections of them. So colonial structures continue to regulate and silence indigenous knowledge systems and ways of being that promote healthy and vital um, living. So the forced settlement or resettlement of indigenous people script system uh, into villages reorganized our spiritual life, reorganized our familial relationships reorganized how we made um, a living and our connection to land. Uh, traditional housing practices were, um, were used uh, as instruments. So the reformation of traditional housing practices were used as instruments by the missionaries and enforced by governments to impose, maintain, and extend their supervision and social control of Indigenous peoples. And this is based on the work of Adele Perry. I don't know if any of you know her, but um, uh, if you do, I'd like to meet her, <laughs> uh, because her work is really significant around this idea of uh, housing used as an instrument of social control. <clears throat> so housing in its early stages on First Nations specifically <clears throat> was uh, seen as an experiment in social engineering. It explicitly linked to religion, the Indian Act, and then the RCMP were used as enforcers of, of a certain type of housing. 
Um, and so there it was very much connected to this notion of morality. So Western housing systems were seen as moral. You see pure, clean, those kinds of words. And our traditional knowledge and our traditional housing, um, the way that we structured our families were seen as immoral, savage, less than human. And again, the, the government was used to enforce this kind of notion. So in the beginning, um, the, the way that the res reserves were set up was they'd be around the churches. And so the priest of that church would have kind of dominion over the people around them so that they would set up a grid so that they knew that the church would be the central meeting place. Um, now that's nothing new. That's been used in history. You know, even if you look at the time of Caesar, that was used to grid out, grid out the constituents so that you could document, survey, um, who is there and what resources is there so you can go in and extract or exterminate. So this is nothing new. This is a strategy with specific tactics to assimilate or exterminate, in this case, indigenous peoples and our knowledge. And also linked to that was the enforcement of heteronormativity. So we see that um, the, the nuclear family structure is the only acceptable structure. So the Indian Act is the first to kind of say what the acceptable family is, who the head of household is, who even gets a name, and who gets a number. That's all part of this control dominate, um, domination scheme. And indigenous peoples were in need of cleansing. And something to think about too um, around Manitoba Hydro and flooding. So there's probably some, uh, if you go back to before Manitoba Hydro, when it was Winnipeg Hydro, um, the language of flooding as cleansing. Cleansing our lands, but also cleansing people. So there's this notion of morality or kind of a hierarchy of who is more um, moral than others is linked to our history as well. <clears throat> Here's some uh, specific examples of social control. Uh, on the bottom right here, this is a permit to leave reserve. So um, you probably, all of you have heard of the PASS system, and there's a really great video by Alex Williams called The PASS System, where he documents and talks to families who remember the PASS system. And the PASS system was that you had to have permission from the Indian agent to leave the reserve or to buy and sell goods, to travel t elsewhere. Um, so that was all controlled by the state or the government as represented by the Indian agent. So even when you went out trapping, they, they had to have a pass system. Pass. This is the um, trapping quota system, which is part of this pass system. And this says Charlie Wilson, that was my grandfather. So this was from our family trap line. So again, you can see um, it's heteronormative because my grandmother, who was also there, obviously, um, was not included on here because she was not considered human at that point, right? Only he was. And then it says married, single, or widowed. So it's also um, kind of enforcing a certain type of family structure. So in this years, from 1945 to 1954, it says the area, which is where our trap line was in the Summerberry Marsh, and which region of it, and how many muskrat quota, and how many did they catch. So you can see for every single year, they caught the quota of muskrat. And when I talked to my dad about this, he said, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, they could always, could have caught more, and that's how they had made their livelihood, right? Um, just eating the muskrat, but also selling for furs. But this was highly regulated. So this is, again, as part of social control. Um, this up here is a blueprint, and there's a lot of um, research and literature written on how blueprints were very much a part of the control system of domination of indigenous people in particular. This was a blueprint from a nation in um, Alberta. So we had no input into these blueprints, and then again, um, they, they, you were given a little manual of how to own a house, how to maintain a house. 
And um, there's a really awful but great for doing critical analysis one online that was written for Inuit people. And I think Peter Kulchiski is just writing about this right now, but you can look it up, um, Eskimo housing manual. And they even go so far as to have a drawing of a caribou, and then they tell you how to cook and clean a caribou. So here's the federal government telling Inuit people how to cook and clean their own food that they've subsisted on for since the beginning of map, since time immemorial, before people can remember. So, and this persists today as well. So these are all forms of social control. Um, and if you get a chance, just start to Google some of this stuff and you'll see some of the language that was used. And this notion of morality is really in there, right? So how to clean, like as if we're not clean people to begin with. Um, you know, how to, uh, all kinds of things that are ridiculous. So the housing crisis, as we all know, is probably one of the most serious and um, timely issues that we're facing. Um, you know, not just on First Nations for Indigenous people, but also in cities and also for students in university. Housing is one of the, the big issues. Um, for Two-Spirit youth, housing is a huge issue. A lot of Two-Spirit youth that are homeless or houseless or couch surfing. And so these, as, as um, you know, thinking about the university structure as well, they're really important, and it's important information to know. So, um, as all of you probably know, in 2012, the social movement Idle No More started. It started with four women in, in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, and very quickly spread throughout Canada, and now a global movement. Um, the, the main focus in the beginning of the movement was to raise awareness around bills C-45 and C-38, which would um, loosen regulation around environmental protection and particularly around waterways. And then uh, Bill C-35 and 48 and also um, kind of erode our treaty rights as well. So both of those bills passed and now we're seeing increased um, movement through streams and rivers without environmental consultation um, with First Nations or without envir environmental impact. And so that's, uh, that has to do with pipelines mostly. Um, so in 2014, um, Sylvia McAdam, who's one of the co-founders of Idle No More, was running for chief in her First Nation. She knew she wouldn't become chief, but she wanted to um, make a statement about uh, the land there that needed to be protected to be protected and the um, treaty rights that people had. And as she went around from house to house, and we heard a story similar to this this morning um, uh, from Judy Klassen, was that uh, she realized, like many of us realized, the, the gravity of the housing crisis. And so we had a meeting of the communications team of Idle No More, and we said, well, why don't we, sh um, try to do a focused campaign to pressure the federal government to live up to its responsibility and up to human rights responsibilities so that people have homes and so people have clean water. And so that's how the One House Many Nations campaign started. And we thought, we'll just start with one house. Let's take some, let's do an educational campaign and then let's just build one house. Um, of course, none of us were house builders, so we didn't know what we were doing. But it didn't take long before people said, well, I know how to build, I'll help. And we had over 300 people contribute either money or um, um, supplies, materials, or their expertise to build one house. And that was the first house, and the idea was that we're going to do education and take action. And if we could do it, you know, anyone can do it. So this is a grassroots movement. It wasn't funded by any governments or any grants or anything like that. 
<clears throat> and so this was the first house that we built and um, it's a, it is a mini home or a tiny home and in building that house we realized um, a few things one is that um, if you start if you take action people want to help right that sometimes it's the psychological block of just doing it so we did it um, that it's possible the second thing is we realized that um, Building a bunch of houses isn't going to solve the housing crisis. In fact, it can actually contribute to it if we keep with the same model that we have now. We also realized that tiny homes, uh, you know, I know they're really popular on HGTV and all that. They're actually, they could be part of the problem <laughs> because you you create so much waste in building that tiny home. You have to build everything downsized, right? So. Um, so we thought it's one house, it's not just about one house, we've got to um, think about a large time. We, we decided that we would work on a village, a sustainable village. And we approached the chief and council of Opaskwayak Cree Nation uh, because they were always supportive of this project. This house went to someone in Big River First Nation, by the way, and he's still living in it. It's off the grid, it has a compost toilet, it's got solar. And so he added a porch on because there's a wood stove in there and it was way too hot in the winter. So we added the porch to move the stove into the porch. Um, so Apasquiac said that they would support what we were doing. Um, and we started the plans for building a sustainable village. So again, like the housing crisis is not a building problem, it's a systems problem. So trying to get, hack the system, all these big systems of social control, education, health, social welfare, justice, housing, um, we're trying to get through all those through hacking the housing system. So how could we hack colonial systems of control? When I say hack, I'm, I'm like, you know, using the metaphor of hacking like the computer gets hacked. Um, but you could also, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the ninja hacking system. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I've already talked about the boreal forest and um, the impact of, of deforestation. So in a Pasquiat Cree Nation alone, there's 700 units needed and that's 3,500 people living on reserve so that doesn't mean 700 people don't have houses that means 700 units are needed those that's families right and how is it that we can have houseless people in the middle of the forest there's the irony um, the sy systemic problem that is leading to destruction of the environment and sustainability has to be a necessary part of the solution and colonial economics just don't work aren't working <clears throat> so what we did is um, we held a bunch of design workshops and so again I'm not a builder I'm not an architect I'm not a designer this is not part of my academic work this is work that I do as a as an activist I guess or as, as a community member it's part of my responsibility um, we held uh, design workshops, which I understand from architects now are called charrettes. <laughs> are there any architects here? Okay, so am I right? Okay, we held a bunch of those in Opasquiac. And I think like many of you from Northern Manitoba, we're only one generation away from our parents who lived 100% sustainable lives, right? Like my parents didn't have running water, they didn't have electricity. So they know how to do that very easily, as compared to me that has to have a remote starter <laughs> on a vehicle when it's minus 40, right? Um, or it's don't want to run out to start the car. But um, so that knowledge is still in our communities. So we had these design workshops with elders and, and community members and knowledge keepers to find out, you know, how was it that we were able to not just survive here, but thrive. We were able to thrive for tens of thousands of years in relationship to the land. 
And those are some of the principles that came out of these workshops. So they generally came into three kind of themes. One is um, the community needs, the design needs, and then using local resources. So for the community needs, they said that we needed spaces that were transgenerational, you know, so that wasn't just one family, that you could have three generations of a family living in the area. That there needed to be um, seasonal processing, like for community events, like for harvesting meat or processing meat or fish. They needed to be safe for children. They needed to be recreation. And it also had to have this um, idea that it had to be beautiful. It had to enhance personal and community investment in the project. And, uh, you know, um, the project we learned about this morning, Mino Bamatsuin. In Cree, we have a similar concept, Mino um, Bamatsuin. And people translate it to the good life. But really, there's a, another meaning to it. And it's, um, it has very much to do with beauty. And I rarely see that translated, but that's the underlying living, um, that living in beauty. So the, the idea of beauty was really important as well. And what is beautiful to our community? From a design perspective, they had to be under 50,000 per unit. Right now, the average cost for a home in northern Manitoba, according to INAC, is 155,000. You know, that's not reasonable for people. Um, most people can't afford that. Uh, they had to incorporate traditional shelter knowledge, and again, that was the elders that provided that. Resilient to unforeseen um, events, future events such as flooding or family structures change. They had to be designed in a way that enhanced the health of the land and also reduced climate change impacts, and configured in a way to provide secondary spaces to improve performance and then share spaces and services where possible, like in clusters. And then in terms of local, made from local resources, built and maintained locally to generate local economies and tuned to the land. Here's some pictures from our one of our design workshops. So we had people um, write, you know, do their designs. And we took all of these designs, there was many of them, these are just some examples. So we took those and then we came up with a few prototype designs. And then we had more community meetings. And then here's where we discussed, uh, we came up with these different shapes. So that, that was kind of the basis of it. This, we'd use this modular design, basically using three or four shapes so that you could clip them together uh, so that you didn't have to cut or move a big rock, you just go around it. So if there's a river, you just go beside it. So if you wanted to go in an arc, you could shape it that way. And that was the kind of thing we came up with. Um, and then we started a... So we ended up building a prototype. And in the process of building the prototype, we won a design award. And with that design award, we had to, as part of the criteria, we had to ship it to Design Expo in Toronto. So that was some of the constraints of the size. It had to fit on a flatbed truck. Um, and also, that was another way to hack the system because we used the m money for the expo to actually pay for the materials. And pe community members volunteered their time and architects, well, well one architect volunteered his time um, to put this all, um, to see this project through. Uh, and then when we, we're done at the expo, we had to ship it back to the PAW. And then we started a training program. So it was a 22-week training program. The focus of it was enhancing land-based knowledge, um, reinforcing and validating indigenous knowledge, specifically from our area, um, land defense. So thinking of housing as land defense, um, and and then design, and then carpentry and and uh, woodwork. And there were ten people, eight people that went through that training, and two supervisors who were training to get their um, red seal. 
and um, we worked with an architect on that as well. And in that training project, the, the people in it were all on social assistance, so that was just part of their social assistance. And they, um, they came up with their own design. And this is a little prototype of, of the small one that they're building now. Um, the guys in the, well, there was mostly men and one woman in the training program also designed a type of um, wood system. So this is the first prototype house. That's in Toronto. That's why there's that huge crane there. <clears throat> so that was at Edit Design Expo. And we won top five design of the, of the whole show. There was about 30,000 people that went through our house while we were there. Um, so then we had to take it apart, send it back to the paw. The person that's living in it, going to be living in it, um, because he was in the training program, decided he wanted to make some design changes. So because they've taken design changing now, design um, training now, he was able to do that. So he added a loft on top of the bedroom and storage space on top of the living room. So this triangular shape is the kitchen. Square is the bedroom, triangular is the entranceway, and then there was another triangle here, but we took that and we're using it as the entrance on this one, and they made a, a bigger bathroom because he knew that because he was going to have a washer and dryer, that he's probably the only one in his family that will have a washer and dryer, so that bathroom space had to be big enough for his family to come. Um, so that's that house, and then the trainees, oh, and this one is made out of cross-laminated timber, except for these extensions. So cross-laminated timber is when you take wood and then you just pile it. So the thicker you can make a wall, the more efficient it is in terms of holding heat. So I, if you could, you're basically recreating a tree. <laughs> and so that's the idea of the design that we came up with based on what elders were teaching us is that we just need to create what we had before. So if you kind of recreate a tree. So it's not a passive house, it's an active house. It's breathing, which means that air can come, you know, it can expand, it can contract, it's alive. And this also rekindled a relationship with the people in the training to, to a tree. So you have a different relationship with a tree if you, if you love a tree, right? <laughs> You treat it in a very different way. And um, it also eliminates this problem of, of mold because the, the air is a breathing house. So then in the training program, they tested out about 13 different designs for these cross laminated timber panels. And they came up with the one that's used here. They're eight feet by four feet. And they created a tool, a big tool like a, a template where they could make a bunch of these and then or went up in about I think it was two hours because all they had to do was click together all the pieces and they're still working on that one now so the idea is we were going to start with one house and then build a cluster of houses with a central unit that would be like a hub or a brain that would help house the mechanics that these would plug into these houses these two are on the grid and on the water for the for OCN <clears throat> but our next site is going to be totally off grid and using a water catchment system and all of that um, and the idea is to use as little electricity as possible so to make these as energy efficient as possible and then down the road a uh, community village so we have a hundred year plan and right now we're in just finishing up year one and we've got the two houses So with that, I just kind of want to share a snapshot of where we are with One House Many Nations. Um, if any of you have expertise or if you want to help out, um, please contact me. My email address is there, alex.wilson at USAS. And we are always taking donations. Again, we haven't used government grants or research grants. Um, and uh, the band hasn't funded the band did fund the training program, but that was social assistance, right? So it's truly a grassroots um, initiative at this point. 
And uh, this summer we're going to be working on the, the next kind of phase. So we need people that can build. There's gardens involved in it. We got um, we did get some funding from Tides Canada to work on the landscaping part, which is building the outdoor kitchen, building an ice shack, and then community garden. It fits into our OCN community gardens project. So um, if any of you have any comments or questions, um, I feel free to talk to me after. Or if there's any questions right now, I think we have a couple yeah. minutes. We have 10 minutes time for Okay. Ten minutes time for questions. Yeah. So maybe here to start. Yeah, uh, I've got a question. I've yep. got too many to consent. My okay. name is Charles. Um, yeah, we've seen the cutting down of uh, trees, yeah. which is really a very big concern. But then uh, my question is, uh, you being the First Nation, and then you are the custodian of the land, so, and you are very much uh, on the ground where these trees are being cut down. So what are you really doing if they are allowing such kind of numbers of trees to be cut down? Then the second the concern is, uh, I don't know the main objective of uh, the federal government, because uh, to me it's like a, it is a hypocrite whereby the Canadian government is able to donate millions of funds outside uh, to other parts of the world and leaving out their own people next door to them without housing. Yeah. So I don't know whether I can answer that question. Yeah, well part of it, part of this campaign is to raise awareness around that very issue. How housing has been used as an instrument of social control. And like I said earlier, you could build a whole bunch of houses. Like, we could go to OCN and build 700 houses. It's not going to solve the housing crisis because, because of the nature of the way that that system works. It's the same thing. You could educate um, people in the mainstream education system, and it's not going to change the outcomes very much. That's why we're not seeing much change in graduation rates, for example. It's the systemic change that's needed. Um, in terms of your first question, um, uh, how do we let people cut down so many trees in our territory? Well, um, I think people from the beginning have um, been doing land defense actions. And there's always been resistance to <coughs> colonial forces and resource extraction. And even today when we say consultation, well, really there isn't consultation in a, in a real way. So um, there's always people that have been standing up against that, right? And like, you know, I said earlier about Ducks Unlimited, if you have a family member working for them, the same as logging. Like, we use wood. Like, you know, we're not saying don't log or don't use wood. We're saying that it needs to be done in a way that sustains us, not exterminates everything. Yep. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I actually brought a class on Aboriginal women in uh, Canada here to, to hear you talk today. Right. Because we, um, the assistant talks about you a lot in her new book and some of the teachings that she's gotten from you around um, clearing Indigenous resurgence and uh, around considering people from the Indian community. And one thing that really stood out for me in your talk was how, uh, and actually, relate that to the readings that we did for today uh, around recognizing different people's gifts and contributions to uh, grassroots organizing and the community. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that stood out for me is how you had different people uh, both contribute in uh, particular ways that, you know, based on their skill sets, but then how people then took on new, new roles and uh, acquired new skills in this process. So I wonder if you might talk a bit more about that, about what that organizing process Look like, and in particular, if you might comment on, on the role of um, gender or trying to kind of subvert notions of gender in, in that organizing process. Yeah. Well, originally, this presentation, which is called Hacking Colonial Systems, I the actual title was Queering, but I didn't really know how this audience would be. <laughs> so, to unpack that a bit, but really, it is a form of queering because queering is like getting at 
like the systemic structures and, and flipping them, right? So I think that's, that's what this is doing. It is queering our notion of what we think of as housing and what we think of as the housing crisis. Um, in terms of organizing, because I Don't Know More is led by Indigenous women, and a lot of two-spirit and queer people are involved in I Don't Know More, but mostly behind the scenes. Um, and so the way that I Don't Know More is structured even is already querying the notion of, of leadership. And that bugs the media a lot. <laughs> And it also bugs people that are used to heteropatriarchy because they they start saying, well, I don't know more has no structure, you know, of, doesn't have one leader. Well, right, that's by design, right? And it's very effective in that way. Um, so we use that kind of non-hierarchic um, model where a community does what's needed in that community, right? So those are some examples. And I think... Um, Today, even, like it's mostly two-spirit people and Indigenous women that are part of the One House, Many Nations. Um, and then when the band formalized it into a training program is when it kind of shifted to a more male narrative. Builders, you know, and, and um, engineers and things. And so it's an ongoing struggle to, to say, wait a minute, you know, that's reinforcing colonialism, that step back and go back to what the needs of the community are, what the needs of the family are. Thanks for that question. Um, there are many examples, actually, in the Sydney Night experiment, as uh, you, you have stated. Uh, I'm particularly familiar with Brazil. Yeah. It's actually indigenous communities have been actively engaging architects from the University of Sao Paulo, designing kind of a very unique and additional uh, peasant oriented housing, which actually challenges that uh, uh, traditional way of actually uh, uh, city planning, urban planning, and uh, which is actually not, not really meeting the needs of the, uh, the marginalized uh, communities which exist. So um, uh, perhaps actually changing more ideas with other groups uh, yeah. down south, particularly indigenous communities. That might be a really good opportunity for uh, enhancing the change, the sharing of knowledge and experiences to develop new housing initiatives. Yeah, yeah, and um, I was in Chile last fall, sharing this, and you know we're still in um, communication with Mapuche people there, uh, people in Colombia, and others. Like I don't know more is a huge network, and it's not in the news all the time, but people 24/7 are doing the work. And that's part of it, is those connections to Indigenous peoples elsewhere. There, there was um, seeds of squash that were mm -hmm. found in the Red River Valley uh, just a few years back. And those seeds grew. And the seeds grew uh, squash that were like three feet long and fairly wide. And they're not viable for today's society. Right, and mm -hmm. the way society lives in these small units. Yeah. So thinking those type of squash would work well with your clusters. Yeah. And, you know, and um, are yeah, you able to get those seeds? Uh, I don't know if it was at the University of Winnipeg or where they were. They're being housed. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great, you know, that's a great they example. Don't have, they're, yeah, they're not, um, they're not uh, susceptible to the bugs we have right now because the bugs have evolved. Yeah. But the squash were stayed intact for six to seven hundred years. Yeah. So. That's amazing, hey? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really important, mm -hmm. and then the food sovereignty part of it's a huge aspect. And, yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank you all, and thanks again for the invitation. Oh, to, thank um, you. Speak. And I wanted to present you with uh, a gift from the Newly Garden <coughs> Lake, so I, uh, Island Lake, and it's a, a carving, and the carver, Sydney Barkman, went and found the rock and carved the rock and created this. Ah, so isn't that beautiful? So there is, it's not just in Nunavut and Inuit. In fact, there is beautiful uh, rock to be carved up in Island Lake and in northern Manitoba, and people are doing it. So it, it's a, a, quite a gift to have you Thank here. You.
and thank you so much for